Hey guys, what's going on? It's Paul and I'm back with the tournament report today and this time it is a huge summer roundup. I took the summer off to continue doing graduate school so I can graduate on time. That is my life. But how could I ever forget Force of Will? This was an amazing summer. We had a big, uh, huge European stuff happen over the summer and we got um, the decisive battle for Valhalla, which I think is an amazing set. And as I've looked over these these recent lists, what we are seeing is a huge change in the meta, and I hope you're going to join me today. If there are any tournaments that I have not discussed in this video, please let me know down in the comment section down below, and I will try and correct it as soon as possible. But without further ado, we are going to get right into it, back in the lovely month of July with GP Zaragoza. So just before we get into this, I want to say that GP Zaragoza was a tournament where Awakening of the Ancients was the newest set. So we're going to see some different rulers, but I think this is where we're going to see some interesting things start to kind of creep into the meta a little bit. So, Gil won this tournament. And from this set, this recent set, um, Gil got a new tool, which he didn't really need, but he got it anyway, and that's uh, 200 IQ. This will let you recycle chance like Fifth Element and Vanish, so you can uh, use Gil's effects all over again. He's got so many recycling effects, why didn't he need one more? But he does. And just keep in mind that Gil needs the graveyard. Gil needs the graveyard. There's a reason he's not really around right now, but Gil needs the graveyard. In addition to Grill, uh, into Grill, the Grifted, whatever I can't even talk right now. Gil, the Gifted Conjurer. We also have Alter Decks, and there's a lot of Alter Decks that appear to GP uh, Zaragoza, which is fair because Alter was arguably the uh, one of the best cards to come out of the last set. And if you're playing Alter, you're probably playing Lila, so you can get Darkness Magic Stones, which is really, really important. But, just say you're playing Loki, now you get also access to the Return of God. So if you're ramping a bunch of Magic Stones, the Return of God ends up being a very, very powerful card. Which, it was already very powerful, but now it's even more powerful. So now you can bring out things like Mosasaurus and the Athenia, Sealed God of the Ruins, a lot faster than you could before. And that's just utterly ridiculous. Return of God, here's your stuff. Also, you're playing Sacrificial Altar, which means you can, you know, play a Lorite at any point. Um, you have the one copy to stop your opponent from going off first, and that in itself makes Altar probably the best card of last format. But then, of course... We had that lovely, lovely release of the battle for New Valhalla. And now is when things get weird. Adam Seichart won GP Frankfurt. Yeah, I said it. Adam Seichart won GP Frankfurt. Now why? Why of all the rulers is Adam Seichart so, so strong, so OP, out of nowhere? Well, that's because of the Angel of Zeus. Already it's a one drop 4-4. Four, four. It's an angel, so it fits into Adam Seichart's natural support. It has flying because it's an angel, which is already good. It changes all of your light magic stones into water magic stones in addition. And they all produce blue because they're water magic stones. But as long as a resonator, a chant, addition, and magic stone is in your graveyard, if all the pieces are there, it gains quick cast, and it essentially gives all of your resonators eternal, but instead of your resonators, it's entities. So it's eternal, but better. It's not a uh, it's not a symbol skill, but it's really really good. It includes itself. It includes any of you, any of your additions that you want to play. It includes all of your resonators, all of your things, all of your entities, including. Um, <laughs> Including this, Dark Alice, Rabbit Princess. This card is amazing. It has 500 defense for a one drop. That is absurd, but it's also a fairy tale, which means it has some support um, just lined up in, this, in the general set as it is. It's got quick cast. Your graveyard cannot be manipulated by your opponent's abilities or card effects, which is also really nice. And as it enters, 
you can draw a card and then either discard a card or banish an entity you control. You're probably going to choose to discard a, a card. And if you have all of the fun stuff that you needed for the Angel of Zeus in the graveyard, the Resonator, the Chant, the Addition, and the Magic Stone, all of your Magic Stones produce whatever you need them to, whatever you need them to produce. Everything's fine. It's all great. Merry Christmas. You also get Adam in Fairy Tale Land, which he's already really good. He's a 14-14 with Drain. He's a Fairy Tale, so all of those things are very good. If you have Rune 5, you can pay 6 less. Now he's a 2-drop 14-14 with Drain. He's essentially March Hare, but even better. And the reason he's even better is because if he's in the graveyard and you're and your ruler is Adam Seichart, he counts for that resonator, for that chant, that addition, that magic stone. And because your graveyard can't be, can't be manipulated, well, he's just going to stay there as long as he wants. Merry Christmas again. But then, of course, you get the funnest card in the whole set, in my opinion, because she counts for all races. And that also includes Fairy Tale and High God, by the way. As long as you have that Adam in your graveyard, she gains plus two, plus two, drain, eternal, first strike, flying, precision, and swiftness. And if you have the need to get rid of anything on your opponent's side of the field, you just pay one of every color, and you just remove that entity from the game. It's a good day. But it doesn't end there, because Adam can go into multiple colors because of Dark Alice. This means he gets access to one of the best cards in the new set, Perfect Loki. Perfect Loki is the the final battle of this cluster. He's really good. He comes in. He can be quick cast, by the way. And he can nuke your opponent's board minus X hundred based on the number of cards that you have in your graveyard. That is incredibly, incredibly powerful. And you don't even need to make him your J ruler to get the full benefit out of Perfect Loki. He basically just comes in and wipes your opponent's board if you have the if you have a, the uh, right amount of cards in your graveyard. He's really good for that. And because you have access to green, you also can play the new Kalgia, and you can manipulate your graveyard however you need to to achieve what you need to achieve so that she gets all of those nice cards in your hand, um, and recover all of your magic stones. She is great. She's quick cast, and she also uh, cancels a target spell. And she's a two drop if you have rune two, which if you're playing Adam Psychart, I don't know why you're not playing uh, rune control. This is essentially what the deck was made to do. So in addition to Adam Psychart, who won this tournament, it's unbelievable. I did not think that Adam Psychart would do so well. And then I also didn't think Loki would do so well, because Loki has not really been seeing a lot of success. We had a, a couple of blips when... Uh, we had like diversity um, being played, diversity evolution with uh, mystery box and all that other fun stuff. We, we kind of had that. But now we're playing a black Loki variant. And why not? Loki has the ability to do so. And we can play the Sephiroth, which is uh, nice. You can come in and harvest to draw a card. You can corrupt it to make your opponent discard a card. It's an addition, so you can't, um, can't treat it like you would a Resonator. And then you can uh, tap it and banish it to produce either green or black. And the, the resonator you play can't be canceled. And you can only play it if, you're, uh, if you control an Athenia deity of harvest and corruption. Uh, which you do, by the way. Spoiler alert. But then you also have Fallen Angel of Fiery Vengeance. This card is not necessarily in the deck to give you access to uh, fire in any sort of way. But it is here to do minus 400 to your opponent's uh, mana fixers. This is incredibly important. This is the reason why uh, we're going to see some... We're going to see why Dark Alice is so good, but also because why this card is necessary in the format to sort of uh, mitigate any of the other decks that want to go into these other into these other colors. Any, pretty much any one of these uh, one drop mana fixers that wants to come in and do, do anything of value is going to have to figure out a way to get around Fallen Angel of Fiery Vengeance. This card is incredibly important. It surges itself out of the deck so you can continue to maintain um, your mana fixing if need be, but you can also play multiple of them from the graveyard by paying 200 per, and then it'll do minus 400 to a J Resonator. This card is incredibly good. You also have Mana Transmuter to pay 300 life and you basically get whatever you need color-wise. 
It'll also work really good for the new Satan card, but we're not going to talk about that until later in the video. But we are talking about Athenia. So Athenia is one of the most powerful cards released in this set, and the reason is because if you have at least one rune revealed, you can choose to harvest and corrupt both. And if you do, you're ultimately going to be doing this. If you harvest, you are going to recover three of your own magic stones, and if you corrupt, you're going to be resting your opponent's magic stones, all of them. And that, the reason that's so important is when this card comes in, if you choose to corrupt and rest your opponent's stones, you're essentially saying, I'm going for the win stop it. And if you can't stop it with like a Lorite or an Arundite Nitrogen Blade or something like that, Keys' Call, if you can't stop this card from going off, you are probably going to lose. In addition to that, you can pay a green to put any number of cards in your own graveyard back on the bottom of your deck, and you can pay a black to remove everything in your opponent's graveyard from the game. Now, granted, if your opponent has um, the Dark Alice card, you're not going to be able to remove their graveyard, but at the same time, this card is still very powerful. It lets you reuse all of your resources however you want to. And I think that is incredibly important to, to recognize in this card. These Loki decks are also going to be running Perfect Loki um, in order for you to play Neo Ragnarok. Now this card is incredibly powerful, but can only be played with Perfect Loki unless you just want to hard cast it. And if you're playing it from the Rune area, it's a two drop Flood the Field. You have to have a perfect Loki, which is not hard to do uh, in this list in particular, but there you go, Neo Ragnarok, and it allows you to play all of these really powerful resonators, and uh, wow, there's a lot of really, really powerful things happening. <laughs> if you play Neo Ragnarok, um, it's really, really hard to win from there, that's all I have to say. In addition to Loki, there couldn't be another J Ruler that is... Not that popular that it got so far, but it did have Isis, which is, you know, why would you ever play Isis? You have Kyrick. You don't need to play Isis. You don't need to play Fushi. You have Kyrick, but now, now you have Isis, and the reason Isis is so good is because, well, first of all, she gets access to Desert Miner, which gives her access to White for all your Fire Magic Stones. And, you know, if by chance this card is targeted by that uh, that Fallen Angel of Fiery Vengeance, uh, it could just banish itself and produce a Fire Moon Edition token. Now, that might seem a little odd to you. Like, why do we... Why? <laughs> why are these tokens? Well, this is the new mechanic that Isis has. Um, and we're going to get into that a little bit later. But just know that these additions are incredibly important. We also have Shu from the last set. Now, this card is able to produce... Um, is able to produce red relatively easy, but it's also relatively important to getting rid of your opponent's Dark Alices because it is able to do, uh, you discard a fire card, it deals 600 damage to a target fire resonator. It's essentially a little bit more of a, of a lightning strike, but it's on a resonator. So this card is actually pretty important. You also have the new Nyarlathotep. And this card is one of the most um, important cards for Isis because essentially the Awakening cost gives you more of those Fire Moon Edition tokens. You can banish one of those tokens, uh, one of those additions, I'm sorry, to prevent the next damage that would be dealt to this card. You can also banish a, a Moon Edition to deal 800 damage to a target J Resonator. So you can banish multiple, you can banish two to wipe out anything on the field essentially. You can banish nine moon additions to gain plus 4,000, plus 4,000, and pierce. And of course, if you have a moon addition on the field already, you gain precision and swiftness, as long as you control that moon addition. This card is very similar to uh, Athenia in that you play this, 
and you're either gearing up to win or you're trying to win this turn. This card is incredibly potent and it's incredibly important. And you know what? Dark Alice is super good, so why not play her in this deck as well? You already have access to white, so why not? But then you also get access to the new Isis card, which is, you know, a decent card. It's got First Strike, it's got Bane. But when it enters the field, you get to search your deck for a 2-drop Fire Resonator or less. It doesn't have to be a 2-drop, but it can be a 1-drop as well if you need it to be. But if that card is near Alothotep, you just put a Moon Edition token into the field. If this card is on the field and your J Ruler is Isis, all of your Moon Editions produce white or red, which means they essentially become their own mana dorks. Now, why is that important? I mean, not only does Isis have a bunch of flip uh, flip side effects that make her incredibly powerful, right? She's able to burn and do a lot of damage and all that fun stuff. That's fine. But what I think about when I look at this deck list is Surtur, who not only has swiftness when it comes in, but he also produces his own Moon Edition tokens, two of which... So if you're playing this card in isolation, you're dealing about 800 damage to a Jade Resonator, which is pretty good. But you can also discard this card, and you can deal the same amount of damage. And you get 400 more for every Moon Edition that you control. So if you're playing something like a Mistletane, and you're bringing your Isis back in, and you're bringing your, your Narlathotep back in, you're able to just continue to play more powerful creatures as the game goes on. And if that's not good enough, you have Spiral of Chaos, which is possibly one of the best two-drop removal spells in the game currently. It's gonna not only going to remove that Resonator from the board, uh, and by remove I mean just get rid of it, it's going to go into the graveyard, but it's also going to do uh, quote-unquote piercing damage to that Resonator, to your opponent's life. That's incredibly important, especially if your ruler is going to be Isis, this card is incredibly powerful. It's really, really important. But let me just give you a chance to look at these three rulers. Why are these rulers suddenly super powerful? Because of this set. This set is incredibly important. If you are interested in this set, I would highly, highly encourage you to go to your locals and ask for this set. Buy this set. It's incredibly important. These rulers are now super powerful. So I would just highly encourage you to do that. We're gonna look at GP Toronto, which was also uh, one of these one of these tournaments that happened in August, right before the set dropped. Um, and we're gonna be looking at Dylan Hunt's winning list a little bit. Um, it's a Lucifer list. If you're not familiar with what Lucifer was doing in uh, Awakening of the Ancients, you're gonna be looking at uh, basically an altar deck that's using Lila to play things like Joan de Arc and Ray the Black Owl, which will flip and give all of your um, all of your entities a little bit of a bubble that will um, be negated by zero on Ray's flip side. And this deck is incredibly fast, it's incredibly powerful. It is the problem deck of that format. So I don't blame Dylan Hunt for running this list, because uh, if you're making... <laughs> if you're making Ryan Miles play Kyrick to try um, and get that win, well, I think Lucifer is a huge problem, and I think it... Uh, I'm glad that it's a little bit different now. I don't know what it's going to look like going forward, but... Here we go. Last but not least, we have the Italian Masters that just happened this, uh, I think this past weekend, right? Uh, November, November, wow. September 2nd. I am in a time warp, folks. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I think, yeah, this happened just at the turn of the month. And this is cluster only. And if you're new to the game and you don't know what cluster only is, it's exactly how it sounds. You don't get access to Rhea Block. But you do get access to new Valhalla. So all of these new cards are going to be accessible. And uh, we have the full cluster now. Which means that we have uh, New Dawn Rises, Strangers of New Valhalla, The Awakening of the Ancients, and The Decisive Battle for Valhalla. All released for access to, uh, th to this main tournament. One thing I want to say as well. Is last year I said something very similar about the Rhea cluster. And it ended up being relatively correct, so I'm going to say it again. This tournament is so important for us to pay attention to because it tells us what rulers, what decks, what strategies are going to be the most potent as we enter Alice Origin Cluster. 
The reason that's so important is, these are the decks that we're going to have to beat. And they might get a little bit stronger. They might stay the same power level. New decks might crop up based on whatever this new cluster is. You know, I don't know what's going to be in it. We do know that Faria and Melgus are coming back. We don't know much more besides that. We do know the number of cards in the cluster. Or the, uh, in uh, A A O zero and A O one. one We do know that. But... These are the decks that we're going to have to pay the most attention to. So make sure that you pay attention to what we are talking about here today. So the winner of the tournament was an Arthur list. Now, if this is surprising to you, Arthur is probably um, probably not the first choice of J Ruler to run machines with. But because of this latest set, Arthur has gotten a lot of really good support that incentivizes you to play... Um, that incentivizes you to play him as a J ruler. So mostly for the most part, you're, you're not going to be flipping Arthur very often. You're mostly going to be playing him for the sake of uh, the Arthur Resonator, which we'll go over pretty soon. But first of all, we got a new one drop, which corrects all of your water magic stones and makes them uh, basically deep wood stones. They produce um, green, but what's the most important, I think, is the fact that this card enters the field with four plus one plus one counters on it. You're going to say, well, Paul, that doesn't really matter all that much because ultimately she's just another one drop that's 400-400. But what you forget is that machines are so powerful because of Lancelot. Lancelot removes 10 plus 1 plus 1 counters from the game in order to blow up your opponent's side of the board and negate their effects. Um, he can remove 3 to blow up a resonator on your opponent's side of the field. So plus 1 plus 1 counters, when you come in with 4 automatically you are so much farther ahead than you were before. Already, you know, bringing in something like a Guinevere to get plus two, plus two um, on your counters, that was already pretty darn good. It was, it was kind of a choice between either, you know, playing that or Vivian to set up additional plays. But this card, in my opinion, is one of the best turn one plays that machines have. Not only are all of your green stones now online, if this card dies, you get to look at the top card of your deck, and if it's a machine, it automatically replaces itself and it gets placed in your hand. That's pretty darn good. This is a one drop. This card is amazing, in my opinion, for what it does for this deck. It's It significantly speeds up the deck, in addition to giving you access to additional colors. But let's keep moving. So I mentioned the Arthur Resonator. This card is really good. It enters the field with a counter on it. You name whatever you want for that counter, and whatever the name of that card is that you named for that counter, this Arthur gains barrier to that card. So you might want to say Severing Blade. In addition to that, it gets uh, plus six, plus six in counters. And as long as your ruler is Arthur, it will refill those counters every turn. And you can remove five of those counters to draw a card. So this card is a draw engine all into itself. You can get an additional draw every single turn, which is, you know, it's fine. That's nice. But what if I don't get this card? Well, there's a nice alternative. There is Machine Core. Now, it's a natural 5-5, five five, but when it comes in, it gets 5 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it. So it becomes a natural 10-10. Ten ten. That is ridiculous. If there's no directive counters on the card... The card doesn't recover, but that's okay, because ultimately what you want at the end of the day is a turn to play this card, get a bunch of counters, so you can turn three lands a lot. These two cards in general are really important for that curve to occur. Now let's say you're getting on, and you say, well, I don't have lands a lot, but I do have this new resonator. This, you know, this, little, this little guy called Deus Ex Machina, the god of the machines. Now, I don't know about you, but I think... <laughs> That this Machina looks a lot like the Machina that, you know, uh, we have in Alice Cluster. Um, with the same, like, giant face thing. And the cape and, you know, the grandeur and all this fun stuff. This thing is a total machine. But I think it's interesting that we have uh, similar designs between the two cards. Is that a coincidence? I don't know. You tell me down in the comment section down below. But regardless, we're going to get into the effect of Deus Ex Machina. As this card enters the field, remove any number of the plus one, plus one counters that you find on your side of the field. If you do, this card enters the field with twice as many of those plus one, plus one counters as the counters you removed. That's also, that's really, really good. So you, you basically just double. Um, your Lancelot's not going to have much of an issue, just removing ten counters to destroy stuff now. 
But if you do have 10 or more plus one plus one counters on this card, it gains flying, it gains eternal, it gains remove a plus one plus one counter, add a plus one plus one counter to a machine you control, or add a counter of a name of your choice on another target entity you control. It refills Arthur at instant speed. If for some reason they remove the counter from Arthur, it refills it. It makes Arthur harder to kill, which means that Deus Ex Machina, Arthur, Clockwork Girl, Lancelot, we have a nice core of cards that all interwork together to do some pretty powerful things for machines. That's incredibly impressive. It's not hard to see how machines won this Masters tournament, and I'm very excited to see what they do going forward because we don't really have many instances of, you know, pure blue rulers doing much but now we we can see that blue one of the worst colors for most of the game's history is now one of the best i think that's pretty great and nothing expresses that more than loki also getting into the top cut this is frederico zopini's list and he's playing a perfect loki list so he's playing for the perfect loki but he's able to j activate into perfect loki if he needs to instead of uh just you know going regular loki uh, which is not advisable in this deck. You want to deactivate into Perfect Loki so you get the ultimate divinity um, and then do all the effects, which is fun. All at Quick Cast, which is fun as well. <laughs> um, but it's a black Loki list, so it's going to be playing Sacrificial Altar, Lila, and then it's going to be playing the Fallen Angel to get the most out of uh, disruption of your opponent's stuff. You're also playing the Athenia um, that does a bunch of bonkers stuff for what you want uh, you want to set your opponent back with. It plays the Sephiroth, so you can uh, draw cards and uh, make your opponent screwed up in terms of how they do things. Uh, but it also plays the Return of God. So you're getting a lot of value from Loki here, because the Return of God is an amazingly powerful card, especially if you end up fetching an Athenia. That's really, really good. But then you're also playing all of the Giants, because you're playing Neo Ragnarok in your, in your rune deck. This card is amazing. I love flooding the field. It's super great. And this is what we have. We have Arthur. We have Loki. These are both of the water rulers. And they're top. Like top dog. That's so amazing to me. I've never, I never thought I would see this. But I'm super happy to see it. Water is my favorite attribute. It's my favorite color of will. I'm really glad to see this happen. But of course we also have Adam Seikart winning. And because we have Adam we have Dark Alice. And we also have Algernon who's coming in, and if you have a bunch of runes, um, I'm sorry, not a, a bunch of runes, but a bunch of magic stones, then you're able to do some fun stuff as well. <laughs> uh, you just be able to tutor whatever you need by removing the counters that Algernon produces. And as you can see, it's a green list, and we're giving access to, uh, to white as a result of this, mostly because you're playing things like the green giant, um, and you're also playing things like uh, the new Kagia as well. But because you have Dark Alice, you also have access to the colors you need to play Perfect Loki, which is perfectly acceptable. And then, of course, you have Kaguya naturally involved if you have the the, the Resonator cat that fixes your fixes your will. And then you have Light of Kuranos, which is gives you full access when you have uh, the Alice, which is Zeus. And what this card essentially does is a one drop. You discard any number of cards in your hand, and then this card deals X hundred amount of damage divided as you choose to any number of J resonators where X is equal to the combined total cost of the cards discarded. And then you end up drawing the same number of cards that you discarded. So it's a huge draw engine as well as a destruction engine, which I think is incredibly important to recognize. So we have Adam Seikart. He's running mostly a green engine. But we also have Isis, who's in the top cut. So Isis is not only good in New Frontiers, apparently, she's also really good in Cluster only, mostly because of all of these cards that we've talked about before. All of these are in Cluster. So all of these will allow you to, with Isis and Nyarlathotep and Shu and all these other cards, it will allow you to ramp into um, things like Ushua to flood the field with Resonators and give them Swiftness, or um, to Surtur who will allow you to destroy a J Resonator, probably a J Ruler, or whatever bomb your opponent's playing with. You also have access to the Godly Aura. A godly Aura is essentially you just generate a Moon Edition, or you can also just put Surtur's effect on a, on a chant, and it's that Quick Cast. So it's a one-drop 
chant quick cast that does the same thing that er, that suitor um Erder, wow Surter does oh ugh, can't talk sorry sorry folks but godly aura is just really good for that then you have moonlight nocturne quick cast put something back in your opponent's hand if it's two costs or less or sorry return target rest of resonator to its owner's hand period this could be anything Makes it even better. And then you get to foresee a couple cards, which is nice. And that's basically scrying if you're coming in for magic and you don't know what that is. It's essentially scrying. Look at the top two cards of your deck. You can put them on the bottom if you want, or you can just rearrange them however you want. It's pretty nice. So we have Arthur, we have Loki, we have Adam Seikart, we have Isis, and now we have Hanzo. And Hanzo's been relatively good. Uh, this is a black Hanzo list, so you're going to be seeing the Altar Package as well as Athenia. And then you're going to be seeing Kaguya a little bit too. Because um, you're going to be able to fix mana. But then you're going to see a couple of Satan in the main deck. Satan is a crazy card. And if you can't read the text, I'm going to just give you the text. While you're searching your deck, you may pay either uh, red or black and reveal the card from your deck. Remove it with a fallen counter on it. As long as you have that counter on Satan while he's removed, you gain whenever an effect you control or a cost causes you to lose life this card is removed with that fallen counter on it you may play this card from your removed area if you do it enters the field with X fallen counters on it where X is the amount that it had removed from play and then when it enters you can choose one you can either choose to wipe your opponent's board equal to the amount of fallen counters that are on the card or you can revive any number of resonators in your graveyard based on the number of fallen counters you have on the card there's a lot going on here and there's a reason I chose to to describe it the way I did. Satan is one of those cards that is is just there to be amazing. Now, I think Satan is a lot better than I think a lot of other folks do. I think this card is just waiting, just waiting to do some amazing things. And uh, we'll have to see what that looks like as the game continues to age into Alice Origin. But of course, because you're running Hanzo, you're running a Ceiling Scroll in the Rune deck. This card is too good. And that's probably the main reason you're you're running Hanzo is to stop whatever Rune they want to play. If that's a, uh, if that's a, specifically, if that's Neo Ragnarok, or if it's a Hand of God, or Return of God, excuse me, or if it's a, a Spiral of Chaos, or if it's anything like that. You know, this card is just really good. Um, so Hanzo is always going to have utility as this green ruler should. Um, it's one of the best ones. We're not seeing a lot of Chumimi. But Hanzo is still pretty darn good. And then finally, we have Brunhild. And what what top tier, uh, <laughs> what top eight list section would be complete without Brunhild? Well, Brunhild has access to the ability. Uh, she's she's flying. She's a twelve twelve. Uh, you put a target resonator from your graveyard onto the field. It doesn't have to be a certain cost. It's just a resonator. And these, I think, qualify. It's just really good resonators to pull out. Um, Trow and Agrabota are really strong resonators. They're going to come out and do some pretty powerful enter effects. Karura is just really hard to interact with. It's a 12-12 flyer with a barrier chant, and it can't be canceled. And then Kagi is also just decent in general. You bring it back, and you're able to modulate what you need. If you if you flip on um, on the right amount of stones, then suddenly your Kagi is amazing and uh, <laughs> what more can I say? And of course, because you're Brunhild, you have access to so much removal uh, by virtue of Blade of Faith. And then you have Volley and Light of Kuranos to back you up as well. Um, Brunhild's just a good just a good ruler. And I think we just need to talk about what rulers we didn't see really quick. We didn't see Fushi. We didn't see Chimimi. Um, we didn't see Lucifer. We didn't see Lich. I don't know what that means, but what I do think that means is that we have to go to the thoughts section. I do not think those rulers should be counted out. Sacrificial Altar is a really, really good card. Um, Discard is still very powerful. There's a lot going on with Lucifer. Lich is really powerful as well. Jamimi, I don't know. Shiva wasn't the best. Shiva wasn't the best card. Just a thought. Didn't really get the most support from this newest set. But she does have uh, Nature's Beauty, which is just this really 
really good master rune that just makes you able to wipe the entire board or just say you don't get the block this turn and I just get to win so I don't think we need to look at those other um, those other rulers and say you know they're just not good enough we didn't see we haven't seen anything from Fushi but I'm willing to bet with the right cards Fushi is going to continue to climb in power he's actually got a lot going for him this uh, with his new set so I'm interested to see what that looks like but we're also looking at rotation Rotation is not happening for a long, long, long time. It is September currently as this video is being uh, being filmed. We're not getting rotation until November. But I just thought we should look ahead now that we have the full selection of cards. What things are we losing? Well, everyone hates wind. Just take a look. Pay tribute to the fallen. These cards are going away. Some of these cards are really fun. Um, I really liked Winds of Vitality. I uh, thought it was interesting that it was a spirit magic and it worked really well with Gil. Uh, we're we're losing um, Scarlet's Agony, Viola. We're losing uh, Dragonoid's Last Days, which it's probably fine. It probably didn't need to exist in the first place, but it did. We're losing Lorite for all of you who hate Lorite. We're losing Fairer Spell for those of you who hate who hate Fairer Spell. We're losing Rachel for those of you who hate Rachel. We're losing all of these, frankly, really fun green cards so that's happening but we're also losing we're losing Kyrick which is probably fine we don't really need red rush all that much in my opinion um, it's always going to be a thing because red is an aggressive color but frankly some of these cards are really fun um, Ultra Dragon super fun Welser super fun um, the tournament and the bangle were all super fun cards to play um, Majin Dark Elf which I thought was absolutely kind of a ridiculous card when it came out um this card's really good and we have all these other fun cards that are just not gonna be able to see play outside of wanderer and that kind of makes me a little sad i'm gonna be a little nostalgic for this set and then of course the most important card we're losing you know what it is rest in peace shayla but what cards from Rhea cluster or cards from Rhea? yeah what cards from Rhea Cluster will you miss or not miss the most in New Frontiers? Let me know down in the comment section down below. Of course, if you liked the video, hit the like button. If you didn't like the video, hit the dislike button. If you want to tell me that I missed a tournament and that I should put that stuff in the description down below, let me know down in the comment section. And of course, all of these lists and more can be found down in the description down below based on the title of the GP. Guys, it is great to be back. It is great to be able to talk about this awesome game with you. Give us some love. Hit subscribe if you like the channel. If you want more content like this, I'll see you around. My name is Paul, and I'll catch you next time.